Hi, uh, thanks very much for the invitation and thanks for having me. I'll try to split the difference between some material that's interesting for those of us who are parents and are observing or otherwise observing the growth of small people and their ability to communicate on the one hand and also a bit of an invitation to connect with uh, some of the work that's happening in uh, the AI community on the other. So language learning is one of the key scientific puzzles in psychology and in cognitive science more broadly. How do we go from speechless infants to children who can understand language and use language to make their way in the world? Every typically developing child makes this transition and as we heard, it happens remarkably quickly. But how do children learn? Well, we know one thing that they don't do. They don't learn just by imitating us or just by formal instruction from their teachers. So uh, here is my daughter, Madeline, at 18 months. And at 18 months, the longest thing that she had said was happy bee, which I think meant happy birthday. At 19 months, she said blue ball. At 20 months, she said move back. 21 months, she said bye bye other pirate. 22 months, dump it, my. No, please don't dump your cereal on the ground. That's what she was asking. 23 months, Spike doggy, no food, eat dirt. Uh, so that's referring to my mother-in-law's dog, Spike, who doesn't eat food. He does, in fact, eat dirt. So that was correct. 24 months, my like, no, this passy. I don't like this pacifier. 25 months, that too big, my too bigger. And 26 months, she's a teenager. Dada, move own body. Might need a little bit more space. So here she is at, at 26 months. She's uh, maybe a pound heavier. Her hair has grown a bit, and she's substantially dirtier than she was at 18 months. Uh, but really, not that much has happened here physically. In contrast, what's happened developmentally in terms of her language is really remarkable. She's able to express herself and make her way in the world. And as I said, she didn't learn this by imitation or by teaching. How do I know that? Well, I didn't tell her to say any of this stuff, and I didn't say any of it. All of this meaningful, interpretable language is actually not really grammatical English, at least from move back uh, on down, right? So what she's doing here is clearly generalizing from data in some interesting, creative, grounded way. And as a, just a side note here, you might ask, well, how much data does she actually have to generalize from? Now, Numbers on the ground are a little bit fuzzy. It's a little tough to estimate these things. But here's a good back of the envelope, uh, upper bound. She has no more than 1 million words per month. So even if she was listening to everything from when she was a baby, she's got about 25 million words to make this uh, that too big, my too bigger generalization. So we're not talking you know, gigascale corpora here. We're talking a relatively modest amount of input in order to learn not just what words mean, but also how to string them together into sentences and how to ground them in her experience to get her way in the world. In my work, I've been interested in developing quantitative theories of this learning problem. And to take a tractable sub part of this problem, I've been interested in learning the meanings of individual words as they're grounded in kids' perceptual experience. Roughly the problem of how the child learns that the word doggy refers to not just this stuffed dog, but also other dogs that are out there. And I was interested in my dissertation work and in some follow-on work uh, in developing probabilistic models that instantiate a kind of a quantitative theory of what it might mean to learn language in this kind of grounded situation, especially with respect to the social information that's present. So we developed a simple probabilistic model of this kind of task. And in the literature, there are a number of other models using different frameworks of kind of uh, more alg algorithmic framework built on uh, early translation models and neural network model uh, that have been developed that all really cover just about the same set of phenomena. They all do the same kinds of things that kids do. Roughly, you might think of the scientific paradigm that's being followed here as the evaluation of learning models, which are candidate scientific hypotheses about children's learning abilities, by putting in some input data and then evaluating with respect to some kinds of outcomes. But what I come, came to realize from engaging in this work for a number of years is that I wasn't really satisfied with the input predictors or the outcomes that we were, we were, we were working with. It's not that I thought the uh, learning models were great. I thought there were probably better learning models on offer, but we couldn't really distinguish between them and simpler baselines because we simply didn't have enough data. So, for example, in the paper that I mentioned from my dissertation, we used a 20-minute corpus of annotated video data. 
That seems crazy, but that's really what was on offer in terms of the amount of data. And by on offer, I mean that's what I did with the weekend or two, is annotate those data. Uh, and in terms of outcomes, what I was interested in fitting was a handful of binary results from the literature. Things like children do task X at time Y. So really, we didn't have much in the way of actual outcomes to be fitting to or to be evaluating on. Uh, in order to build quantitative theories, to have scientific hypotheses that ground out into data, we needed more data. And so in the work that I'm going to tell you about now, really what I've tried to do is to gather and systematize the extant data on child language, put them in a format so that we can begin to evaluate learning models more systematically. The kind of phenomenon that I was interested in in this early modeling work was something like this. It's a well-known observation that there's an exponential trend in children's vocabulary growth. So you might want to put as a constraint on a, an unsupervised learning model, for example, that it also shows some sort of exponential trend. OK, uh, there are a lot of ways to get an exponential trend, in fact. Uh, but when you go to data on children's learning, it's a little bit messier than that straight exponent. It's true that the median learning trajectory does look like an exponent, at least until you reach the ceiling of whatever instrument it is you're using. But really, the problem is that you're averaging across a tremendous amount of variability. It turns out that children take many roots into language when you start looking more closely. And we want to understand in our models both what's consistent across kids, across cultures, across languages, but also what is variable, what the sources of those variability are. And it turns out that uh, we weren't the first folks by any stretch of the imagination to think about the problem of data in language acquisition. Others had noticed this importance of studying individual kids to learn about the trajectory that a single kid had followed, and also the variability between kids. There are two important antecedents here, one on the outcome side, one on the input side. On the outcome side, folks uh, had developed an in inventory called the MacArthur Bates Communicative Development Inventory, uh, which I'll tell you about in a moment. And then they had shared those data, data from thousands of kids learning English and later Spanish, so that people could learn about the variability between kids. And on the side of uh, input data, there's the Child Language Data Exchange, or CHILDIS, which actually since the early 80s has been sharing all of the transcripts of parents and kids talking that were available in the field of child language. So now there are millions of words worth of transcripts uh, laboriously transcribed by graduate students and research assistants so that you can look for individual rare phenomena that children are learning about. So there's a great model here for data sharing. And that's what we're going to try to build on to try to create systematic tools for model evaluation and for generalization about the sources of that consistency and variability in kids' learning. So let me go into depth first about the MacArthur Bates CDI, Communicative Development Inventory. So as psychologists do, we have a kind of fancy acronym for what's essentially just a checklist. It's just a, a, a worksheet. It's a bubble sheet. You give this to parents, and you say, OK, uh, what words does your child say? And if they're younger and no, don't know as many words, you often say, what words does your child understand? These things come in two flavors, words and gestures, which asks about younger kids, or words and sentences, which asks about older kids. And by older, I just mean up to about two and a half or maybe three at a maximum. After a kid gets to be three, it's hard to ask the parents, uh, does your child know the word uh, insufferable? And you're like, I don't know. Maybe they know it at school, not sure. But it turns out uh, parents, especially parents of young kids, are pretty good observers of their, uh, their young children's vocabulary development. And so you can ask questions like, does your child know the word ball? Do they say ball? Do they understand it? Uh, and do they know table? Do they say or understand? And maybe each individual answer about each word is not that good. But in the aggregate, you get something that is surprisingly reliable and valid. It's a pretty good psychometric measurement of that individual kid. So it turns out if you go and then you uh, transcribe that kid's speech, you can find mo many of the words that the parents say they say and the diversity of the speech that they exhibit in the lab in an expensive, time-consuming transcribed session is actually you know, pretty similar to the diversity of their vocabulary when you just measure it by sending home a bubble sheet. So uh, this thing is, is quite a, a reasonable instrument, and people use it all over the world for measuring kids for clinical uh, purposes or for evaluating interventions or these sorts of things. 
It turns out because these forms are simple and inexpensive to administer, you're literally just sending something home, a piece of paper or more recently a, a URL, uh, they are used all over the world and they've been adapted to more than 100 languages and dialects. And what I mean by adapted is a, a team in, this, in another country or speaking another language or dialect decides that they would like to measure language development in that dialect or language. And so they create a new form with uh, the words that are culturally appropriate. Uh, sometimes there are more words or fewer words. Sometimes there are specific items and so forth. So that turns out to create a really awesome opportunity for people interested in consistency and variability and outcomes at scale. To take advantage of that opportunity, we created a site called WordBank. So WordBank is our attempt to aggregate data from those cross-linguistic studies of language development. So we recontacted all of these folks who had conducted large-scale norming studies of a CDI form, one of these checklists, not just in English, but in Danish or Norwegian uh, or uh, a number of other languages. So I'll switch over now to the actual CD, uh, WordBank site, which is live here. Um, and what we tried to do was create you know, a basic backend to store these things in a consistent format so they could be queried. Uh, and then we created an API so that we could query these in a flexible way and create visualizations. And we're now up to you know, more than 80,000 administrations, 29 languages and di or dialects, 56 different instruments. So we're gathering these data on kids' outcomes. And we have what we think is the largest database of kids' outcomes across languages. So if you want to make generalizations, these are the kinds of data that you need to be getting. And of course, there are issues with generalizing from parent report. But by triangulating between this and smaller scale experimental studies, we make a little bit of progress. And so then with a resource like this, you can do interactive visualization. So you can look at normative patterns of vocabulary growth across languages. So this is just a browser. You can look at, I don't know, say you're interested in Cantonese, you can look at the normative pattern of vocabulary growth, um, and maybe you could split this by some demographic if it was available in the, uh, in the data, and you could say, for example, see that in, uh, in Cantonese, and it, as I'll show you later, in just about every language we have, uh, girls are learning substantially faster than boys in terms of vocabulary, which is an interesting pattern to be explained. Also, if you were designing a study for example, you might be interested in what the first couple of words are, or maybe you want uh, to know uh, some words that kids do and don't know at a different age. So you could look at individual items in English or in any of these other languages. Um, so I don't know, I, I don't actually know Hebrew, but I've got these glosses in here, so I could look, it looks like ouch is acquired very early. I bet hippopotamus is not, surprisingly early. Um, and so forth. So we've got this kind of nice list here. And of course, you can do fancier things if you want. Um, so uh, you can create um, network type visualizations. And I'll show you a little bit about these networks later on. But you can examine how they, uh, the network of lexical items grows over the course of acquisition using various different um, edge models. So uh, this is showing by default a, a vector, simple vector space model, a word to vec uh, model, giving the edges between particular words here. Okay, so using these data, we can then start to ask what we can learn from cross-linguistic data. And actually, this goes back to the broader program of linguistic inquiry that started up really with the Chomskyan revolution in the 60s. So at that time, folks were really interested in what the universals were that underlay the uh, diversity of languages in the world. And one way of getting at those was typology, was looking at the kinds of grammatical relationships or lexical items or semantic structures or whatever it was uh, that uh, were, were present in individual languages. But another was through acquisition, was to try to posit the kinds of universal mechanisms or universal principles that would lead children around the world to learn their different languages as quickly and reliably as they do. So although the specific universals or kinds of frameworks for universals that were being posited then are maybe not the ones we think about now, actually we have the same kind of data that you might want to use to evaluate these sorts of claims, right? Uh, if you're making a claim about universality, literally what you're saying is it should show up in the data of kids learning every language. And so we can ask 
about what patterns are relatively more universal and what patterns are relatively more particular, meaning grounded in different languages or cultures. Now, uh, so for some individual phenomenon, we can evaluate that. Of course, we don't really have universality. What we have is consistency, which is just a t statistical measure. In fact, what we can do is just look at the, essentially the variance of a particular phenomenon across languages, and that gives us a literal measure of the consistency or variability of that phenomenon. So uh, if we have something that's relatively more consistent across the languages in our sample, that'd be an aspect of language development that would tend to be more invariant across languages and cultures, by definition. And on the variable side, a large variance term means that we have an aspect of language development that varies with culture, context, and language. Uh, of course, we're not really going to get at universality here. Uh, Cross-linguistic universality, it turns out, requires a large and typologically diverse sample. And although we have a decent sample, 29 languages or dialects, it's not bad. That's far from what we need to make a generalization about all human beings. Uh, most of our languages are Indo-European languages, although now we have a few Asian languages, a couple of African languages, and, and uh, a few from other families. So we're not going to try to say something is truly universal, but we can empirically measure the variance in our sample. And there's going to be some bias based on language family, but we're not doing too badly. Uh, so our goal in this study is then to assess variability quantitatively across phenomena so we can begin to drive these sorts of inferences. Yeah? So if the hypothesis is that a certain grammar structure uh, delays the learning of words, uh, is language here implicated as a tag of words or what's the relationship between grammar and words? Yeah, great, great question. What's the, what's the relationship between grammar and words here? So, so the classic generative theory of uh, universals and language acquisition really focused on grammatical structures. We don't have direct access to grammatical structures. We do have some measures of grammatical complexity, which I'll come back to in a bit. Uh, but we're not going to be able to tell you about some of the kind of more esoteric grammatical phenomena that have been claimed out there. But we can say things about how complex the combinations are that kids make in terms of words. So the CDI doesn't ask, um, does your child uh, understand anaphoric one, like uh, go get the red one. That's just not, that's not a question that parents really think about. It doesn't say, do, do they generalize the determiner as an abstract syntactic category? Because it's very hard to ask that of parents. But it does ask things like, does your child say mouses or mice? So uh, measuring morphological overgeneralization does say things like, uh, does your child uh, say want ball or I want the ball, measuring the omission of function words, so forth. OK. So uh, I want to tell you about four cross-linguistic findings. Oh, one more question. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, so is this um, uh, is this uh, instrument valid for kids who are only for kids who are already producing language, or for kids who are gesturing and so forth? Uh, so the younger instrument is called Words and Gestures, and it goes from eight to eighteen months in terms of its validity. And at first, you're, what you're asking about is, does your child say or understand ball, bottle, no, mom, dad? And so uh, you'll get that the child understands those things, but it maybe doesn't produce most of them. That form also asks about gestures, which I've omitted from this talk, but it turns out that early gestures are a really reliable precursor of language, and so you get this pretty strong predictive relationship between that early gesture for communication and the words that are being denoted by the gesturing. So you get early gesturers talk more. We actually have uh, data from a couple of different signed languages. Um, so when I said other language families, uh, we have American Sign Language and British Sign Language here in the database. And you ask the question in exactly the same way. You say, does your child say or understand? And then you give a picture of the particular hand shape. Uh, so, so actually, yes, the, these sorts of instruments have been used with sign languages. The samples are much more heterogeneous in terms of background, right? Uh, there aren't that many native signers that are acquiring from birth that you can study in this way. There are many more kids who have some sign exposure and some non-native input or getting a cochlear implant and so forth. So it, it's a much more complicated picture in terms of those data. But yeah, the, these instruments can be used for signed languages as well as for gesture. Okay, so let me tell you about four uh, generalizations uh, 
that you can make from these sorts of data on cross-linguistic findings, and then I'll turn a little bit at the end towards uh, generalizations that you can make a, uh, on the basis of learning models, or let's say models of some sort of the learning process. So I want to show you evidence first that the first words that children utter are very consistent across languages, and they tend to be largely social in nature. Second, across children, variability is a constant in early language. Kids are very different from one another in terms of their language abilities. Third, uh, it turns out there's a, what's called a noun bias in early language, and that tends to be quite, uh, quite consistent across languages, but verbs and adjectives appear to vary by language. Some languages, verbs and adjectives are hard, others, they're actually just as easy as nouns. And finally, addressing this question about grammar, the growth of children's grammar is extremely tightly linked to the growth of their vocabulary. I think implicating a process in which grammar is a generalization directly from the vocabulary that you have on offer. Okay, so, so just to orient you, uh, you've probably seen this if you have a child of your own or have observed another child learning language. Uh, language emerges around the first birthday in a visible state by the first birthday. Around 80% of kids will have produced a first word. So I'm plotting median production across languages uh, by the child's age and months. So you don't see a lot of words by one-year-olds. Usually they're producing one or just a handful. Turns out uh, in terms of comprehension, things start uh, in a measurable way earlier. So there is some evidence that six to nine month olds can comprehend words. If by comprehend we mean look at above chance rates at a picture relative to another picture, this is like 52% correct out of, you know, with a baseline of 50. So uh, language is starting slowly in comprehension and then breaking the surface through production around the first birthday. What do kids say? It turns out they say just about the same stuff in their first 10 words across a tremendous range of cultures. So here's a set of 10 languages for which we had good translation equivalents. Uh, and you can see I've bolded those words that are shared across more than four. And most of this slide is bold. So you see that kids are saying grandma, mommy, daddy, bye, child's name, yum, yum, peekaboo, no, hi, and so forth. These are words for people, words for small objects, and words for social routines. Uh, social routines include things like peekaboo, yum yum, no, hi, bye. Kids love to communicate. They love to interact socially, and the ways that they interact are things like greeting and saying goodbye, uh, asking to be picked up, which is a nearly universal gesture, put your arms up to lift me up, um, and so forth. So it turns out that there's this social core to what kids are saying very early on that's surprisingly consistent across languages. You might imagine that cultures differ in their priorities, and it's certainly true that they do at some level, but kids don't differ as much as cultures do in some sense in their priorities. They know what kids like. That said, when you look at variability in overall vocabulary size across kids, it's really striking. So this is now uh, the number of words produced. Each dot is a child. These are just the English data. And this goes from 16 to 30 months. So this is the older inventory. Uh, and what I'm marking here is the median for 24-month-olds. So just take a look at this. Uh, there are 680 checkboxes on the form. And there are a substantial number of kids in this sample who are producing very close to that 680. These are the little chatterboxes. They're wandering around saying all kinds of things, even though there are only two. On the other hand, there's a substantial portion of the kids that are producing almost no words, even though they're two, and their parents are probably starting to get concerned. Statistically, you might look at the deviation from the median. So the mean absolute deviation from the median uh, is like a coefficient of variation for the normal distribution. It's basically an effect size. How big is the variance relative to the mean? It turns out the variance in the mean, or the mean absolute deviation and the median are essentially the same size here. There's a coefficient of variation of about one. So if you take a sample of these kids, take a sample of two-year-olds, and you'll see this if you walk into a two-year-old classroom, some of them can talk a ton, some of them can barely talk at all. And that's true throughout the range. So what we wanted to ask is, is this a fact about the US? Is it a fact about this particular sample? You know, parenting practices in the United States vary quite widely. Socioeconomic status varies quite widely in the US. Uh, the kinds of early caregiving situations vary. We might expect that US kids might be all over the place in terms of language. Maybe these kids down at the bottom are socioeconomically 
uh, deprived or in parenting situations that are not ideal. They're not hearing a lot of language. Kids up here, uh, maybe those are the kids that are growing up on Stanford campus being talked at constantly by PhDs around them or something like this. You know, maybe my daughter's up here. No, I, I actually don't know. I, I, I think she's probably, you know, anyway. Uh, so you could ask this, and we did. We simply calculated this statistic across uh, the uh, a for each age, the coefficient of variation, and you can plot that across the languages in our sample, and here you go. What you see is with a very high degree of consistency from about 12 months to about 24 months, you see that the coefficient of variation is essentially one. The deviation from the median is the same as the median. Whatever that median is, and these forms are different in various different ways, uh, you see huge variation. And the degree of that variation really doesn't seem to vary much by culture. This isn't a function of the fact that parenting is disparate in the US and maybe very consistent in another culture. Instead, you'll actually see that the variability in, say, Korea or um, the, in the um, Beijing Mandarin sample where we have uh, fewer differences in childcare practices, fewer differences in number of siblings and so forth, uh, the uh, variability is just about the same. So uh, this is a very big effect by social science standards. If you look at this, um, here's the mean uh, between 12 and 24 months for the languages in this sample. And irrespective of the form that we're using to measure, more or less irrespective of culture, we've got that huge variability. So this appears to be a fact about what it means to be a toddler, which is that some of you toddlers are interested in language, and some are maybe not as interested or not as skillful with it and are breaking in much later. There are different routes into language taken by kids. And that's an important thing that we should think about in terms of designing learning models. We both want them to be robust in the sense that they acquire the same basic language competence by a certain amount of input, but we also might expect them to be tremendously variant in the degree to which they perform well kind of earlier on in the learning trajectory. So showing you this makes it sound like there's no demographic variation or systematic demographic variation in this data, and that's not true. I won't show you all of the demographic analyses that we've done, but I, the reason why I focus on this is because it's such a huge effect. But there are a number of other demographic effects that are quite large. Uh, I'll just show you one of these, because I mentioned it in the demo, that uh, there are biological sex differences between uh, vocabulary, in, in vocabulary. Uh, and so this is that plotted across 24 languages. What you see is a smoothing curve. Uh, the dots indicate sample size. You can see there are radically different samples. And what you're getting is a median uh, for each age group across uh, months, with red being female and blue being male. And in 20, uh, three out of the 24 languages, we see a characteristic female advantage of about the same magnitude. You know, sort of roughly a third of a standard deviation. The kind of effect that is not quite visible in a preschool class, but per almost. If you look at a preschool class and you say, well, okay, who, who are the big talkers here? More of them are going to be the girls. Uh, so this is surprisingly consistent. Uh, in fact, it's so consistent that when we don't see it in a sample, uh, for example, in the Hebrew or the Italian sample, uh, we actually call them up and say, well, are you sure? Did you code your genders right? Because uh, this seems like a very consistent pattern. Uh, and you might have imagined a priori that this is something that's very culturally permeable, that might have to do with the particular cultural stereotypes about gender as a function of biological sex. Uh, in this case, that didn't happen to be true. Uh, later on in development, I think those cultural effects are well documented, but here we didn't see that. Okay, uh, let me show you a couple of uh, more syntactic type of phenomena here. The first is about the composition of vocabulary in terms of the part of speech, roughly, uh, syntactic category. So there is an old observation in child language research that there's an overrepresentation of nouns, of names for things in kids' vocabulary. This is one way of plotting these sorts of data uh, from a paper by Elizabeth Bates and colleagues. So what you see here is uh, the percentage of different categories in the child's vocabulary plotted by the size of the vocabulary, and it's not a linear axis here. Um, it's an old plot. Um, but you see that relative to the baseline, which is the percentage on the form, which is, that's the dashed line, nouns are overrepresented, especially in that kind of middle period of acquisition. Um, predicates, verbs and adjectives, are relatively underrepresented. And function words, the, of, and, and so forth, are very underrepresented in children's early speech. They tend to leave these sorts of things out. <laughs> 
Um, of course, the nature of the question is why is this? Why do we see a noun bias? Well, nouns are more frequent, turns out. They are more concrete, uh, so easier to, uh, to visualize. They're easier to learn by statistical observation of the co-occurrence of the word and the thing. Um, so this is called cross-situational learning in the psychological literature. So you could imagine kind of counting the number of times you see a dog in front of you and hear the word dog. And probably there's a pretty good co-occurrence in that matrix relative to the number of times you see a dog uh, and hear the word cat. It's not perfect, but it's not terrible. In contrast, it's not clear even what you're counting if you're trying to learn the word of that way or make, make breakfast, make the bed, make uh, you know, make a souffle. Who knows what you're talking about making at that point? So it's hard to know what to count over. So, so nouns are easy to learn this way. They're also often less morphologically complex. They don't have a lot of endings on them in many languages, although they certainly agree in certain in, in gender and in, uh, and in um, plurality in many languages in our sample and so forth. So, one lever into trying to understand why it is that kids like nouns in their early vocabulary is to look at cross-linguistic and cross-cultural variation, try to pull these things apart. So here's the analysis we did. Uh, we are doing, uh, I kind of call them bean plots, just for kicks. Uh, they sort of look like beans to me. Uh, these are um, plots of the proportion of the child's total vocabulary um, with the, uh, the vertical axis plotting the proportion of the target, nouns, predicates, or function words. So if your vocabulary underrepresents a particular category, you should slope below the diagonal, like in function words. These are English data plotted here. Uh, in contrast, if you're overrepresented for something, you should be above the diagonal. And of course, the, the, uh, these curves are pinned at zero and one because if you have no vocabulary, you have no nouns. And if you have every word on the form, then you have the proportion of the form that uh, is nouns. So then you can integrate between the, uh, the curve, which is some, some smooth function. I think this is a, a, a locally linear regression, uh, and the diagonal, which gives you a proportion bias in the vocabulary. And you can compute that bias across each of the languages in our sample. And so now you've got an analysis that's a little bit independent of the fact that in some languages you have older kids, some languages you have younger kids, some languages more words, some fewer words, and so forth. So these. Uh, once you've normalized everything into this unit interval uh, and, uh, and integrated, you're, uh, you've got a kind of um, dimension-free bias. Uh, and here are the data across languages. These are sorted by degree of noun bias. So what you can see here is just about every language has a, in fact, every language in the sample has a positive numerical bias for nouns, although the size of that bias varies. Uh, so German, Korean, Danish, English, Norwegian have these big biases. Mandarin and Cantonese, as has been noted earlier in the literature, uh, have smaller biases. So what is it about Mandarin and Cantonese and the noun bias? Well, that's, that's an interesting question. Um, one thing you might ask is whether this is relative to East Asian culture in general. That's a generalization that's been made. Uh, that appears not to be true given the Korean data. We're waiting on Japanese data uh, coming in to confirm that. Um, but you, then you might look to specific linguistic features of Mandarin, for example, the lack of morphology uh, or the concreteness of specific verbs in Mandarin as a possible explanation. And then you can look at Mandarin and Cantonese uh, down here in the predicates column and see that they're the only languages that have a numerical bias towards having lots of predicates. So there's some kind of interesting cross-linguistic dynamics that might help you understand what's going on here. Last thing I want to say about this is just uh, to notice how variable the predicates are. They go from a positive bias to a negative bias and kind of everything in between. So there's probably a bunch of interesting things happening from language to language and maybe even culture to culture that determines whether verbs and maybe adjectives are easy to learn. In contrast, nouns are basically you know, words for objects, and they're pretty easy to learn everywhere. Maybe they kind of trade off with uh, the predicates in some languages where the predicates are easy to learn. OK, last observation uh, gets even more at the question of the growth of kids' grammar. So in the classic generative story about language acquisition, the one that you read in uh, generative textbooks, I, you might hear that syntax emerges, children's grammatical uh, ability emerges based on its own maturational timetable, a series of kind of universal stages in which kids uh, 
learn particular principles that govern grammatical generalization. Uh, if you go to a kind of school of education and you hear about Piagetian type stage theories, this is kind of the same sort of thing for language, right? Kids go through individual stages in which things get kind of more complex in a particular rule governed way. So that's one possible way that kids' grammar could grow. Another possibility which is increasingly uh, of interest to the language acquisition community is the idea that syntax emerges out of generalizations from individual words and phrases. And then the, those generalization mechanisms that allow you to go uh, from individual repetitions to a productive use of a particular word or phrase or construction uh, become a target for modeling and uh, experimentation. So one piece of evidence that has been given for this other view that syntax emerges from generalizations uh, is the striking relationship between children's grammar and the size of their lexicon. So this again is from Liz Bates. And what you see here is plotted by vocabulary, the complexity of children's grammar. And I can't say a, that much about exactly what's complex here. Uh, so this is, a, this is a composite score with lots of different questions of the type that I was describing earlier. But I, the basic pattern is that there's a pretty tight relationship between the size of the vocabulary and how complex the child's grammar is. Um, now, you don't really see much in the way of variability here. You see standard errors, which is actually kind of uninformative. But if you plot this for the nine languages in our sample for which we have the uh, grammatical data, you see this same relationship. So just to highlight the English data here up in the corner, um, what you see is that the more grammar, the more vocabulary you have, the more units grammar you have. So, uh, and these things are very, very predictive with R squareds between what the bottom is about 0.87 or something to uh, 0 0.92, 0 0.93. So what this pattern suggests is that regardless of the gra specific grammar you're learning, the more words you have, the more traction you have on that grammar. And I think this really should constrain our models of where that gra grammar is coming from. We should start to think about this as a particular finding that should be really reproduced by learning models. All right, so, so what I, I promised you here was to place languages, uh, languages to place phenomena, rather, uh, on a continuum between what's consistent across languages and what's variable across languages. And now we can do precisely that. All I've done is calculate the coefficient of variation across languages on each of these particular quantities that I computed. So just to orient you here, this is the female advantage that I showed, which has a coefficient of variation across languages of like 0 0.4, 0 0.5. So it's somewhat variable across languages, but there's also some real consistency in the fact that girls talk earlier. Highlighting toddler variability. Toddler variability is highly consistent across languages. The fact that kids are all over the place, that that variance is high. In contrast, the noun bias, it's kind of like the female advantage, maybe it's a little more variable. Uh, so there is some consistency or universality to the noun bias and what we see. Uh, in contrast, predicates are really all over the place. The variance is much bigger than the mean. And finally, the most consistent thing we see is that grammar appears to be emerging in concert with the lexicon. Really, to me, pointing strongly to this process of generalization. Okay. So these are a couple of insights in terms of what we can say about the broad course of language acquisition by examining these data. Now turning back to this idea of learning models. So uh, what I started by saying is, look, we want to evaluate learning models, but we don't have good input predictors or good outcomes. What I've given you is a database of outcomes that we can use to evaluate models. Um, I want to show you just a little bit of work we've done in this direction so that you get a flavor for the kind of things that we're trying to do. So in particular, what we've done is we've used a trick that was developed in the language acquisition literature where you don't try to predict what happens with individual kids. That's probably a function of their demographics and their specific life history and a lot of stuff that you don't know about. Instead, you try to predict individual words. So you can notice that, say, dog is an easier word than jump, and try to predict why dog is easy and why jump is hard. Is it the fact that you hear dog more than jump? Is it the fact you see more dogs than you see jumping? Is it something about the grammatical complexity of the sentences in which they occur, or the verbal complexity of saying those words. So we can leverage our data as a set of outcome measures with variability on these different predictors in order to try to evaluate these sorts of hypotheses. So we can take these word level trajectories, 
which words are easier or harder, and use them as a target for prediction. And in this first study, and in fact in the second one I'll show you as well, all we are doing here is pretty much linear regression. We're just trying to get a better outcome set and put in some predictors. We can map these predictors across languages through hand-checked translation equivalents, which we have in this database now, so we can, use, we can kind of query the appropriate word uh, with respect to a particular predictor set. And we could do things like looking at whether word form predicts acquisition, or, or at least production. Uh, so uh, a simple proxy for this would be the number of characters. I think we've actually subbed in the number of phonemes now, because you can get that from some cross-linguistic resources. So a longer word should be harder to produce, and so that should be a predictor of the age at which kids produce it. So, Further, you can use cross-linguistic resources on meaning. So you could look at the uh, databases where people have rated the concreteness, like the conceptual concreteness of particular words, um, and use that as a predictor of whether children will learn it early or late. You can look at emotional predictors, like whether a uh, word has a positive valence or negative valence, or whether it's high or low arousal. You can even look at predictors that people have developed, like whether baby is like particular things. It goes by the name babiness. And you could also look at children's input. Of course, if you want to look at their input, even input from not children that you've measured, but other children, a separate sample, you need corpora, you need corpus resources. And as I mentioned, there is a corpus resource uh, that documents conversations between parents and children, giving you a good proxy measure, for example, for frequency counts. So what we've done here is uh, do kind of the same thing for, uh, for the child's database, which is the corpus resource of conversations between parents and children that we did for the uh, um, for the CDI forms. That is, we created a database backend, uh, we created uh, versioning and reproducibility, um, and an application programming interface so that you can actually query children's input data and get frequency counts within a particular age range for a particular language with particular lemmatization and so forth. So if you're interested in actually querying corpus statistics and connecting those to uh, the kinds of outcomes that we have, this is the sort of tool that you need. Uh, and so we have, as, as with, child, uh, with WordBank, we have in ChildSDB, the name of this project, we have uh, visualization apps and interactives that you can play with. Um, but more critically for our purposes, we have an API with consistent documentation and an easy to use interface that allows you to actually pull in these data as needed to do the kind of predictive uh, uh, computations that we're interested in. So, ChildSDB is our tool for doing this. I encourage you guys, if you're interested at all in Corpus NLP um, or evaluating learning models that operate over Corpora, to check this out, because hopefully this makes the gap between using your model on uh, kind of standard Corpus resources and child language Corpus resources much, much smaller. You really just need to plug in the appropriate API calls. Mm -hmm. Great, the question was about uh, bilingual kids. Uh, and so, no, in these particular studies that I'm showing you, every kid is monolingual. And that's for a particular reason, that it's easy to create clinical norms for monolingual kids by measuring just the one language of interest. And so these, the data that we're taking advantage of were uh, used to create those clinical norms in a lot of cases. There is a lot of work now using the CDI and Childis to examine bilingual kids. Raises a bunch of interesting issues that have been considered in this literature, but uh, I'm not considering them here. So it's a really interesting set of questions that we're just beginning to address with these resources in terms of trying to appropriately tag folks from uh, a variety of different populations, including bilinguals, including folks with developmental disorders or language disorders and so forth. Okay, thanks. All right, so just, uh, just a quick result from this simple regression analysis. If we throw everything in the pot, and this is not a learning model, this is simply a regression, uh, we can then uh, begin to look at the weights on each predictor and try to interpret those with respect to what makes words easier or harder. So uh, just to call your attention to length, harder words, longer words are, are uh, harder, they get uh, produced later. Um, in contrast, uh, words that are said earlier, uh, said, said more, are, are, are uh, learned earlier. Words that are more concrete are learned earlier. Words that are in, liked more by babies 
are judged by adults to like more by babies. I learned earlier, that's kind of what I told you. Babies like certain stuff, and it's very predictable, um, and so forth. So we can use this kind of uh, regression format to get a basic sense of which predictors uh, in the input uh, should be most important. And those are probably the ones that we're going to want to start in a zeroth order approximation model trying to include. Further, uh, one interesting finding from these regressions is that if you fit them independently across languages and then look at the uh, correlations between the coefficient weights, the coefficient weights are really similar across languages. The same factors matter for kids learning English as for kids learning Mandarin as for kids learning um, any of the other languages in this particular sample. So I think that's a very interesting finding. You could imagine that there's a really different path into language for a kid learning Korean or Mandarin or Turkish than learning English or German or Norwegian or Danish, right? Different language families, different kinds of languages, different morphological complexity. There's a lot of differences there. But at this very high level, we see the same factors influence what kids learn. I think that's a pretty exciting finding. So the predictors of acquisition are highly similar across languages. Now, in just a baby step towards looking at actual models that consider some sort of learning structure, we can leverage the structure of those lexical networks that I mentioned to try to understand whether the relationships between words are also predictive of acquisition. So a lexical network is just you take the uh, words that a child, and we're going to talk about the average child here, uh, the words that a child at a particular age knows, and you put edges between them. Uh, derived from, for example, the semantic or the phonological features of those words. So you create a network structure. Um, you could use word embeddings here. Uh, in these studies, we're using simpler features, uh, kind of hand-coded semantic features. Uh, so you, you put edges here, and then you can compute statistics over those edges uh, and the network in order to ask whether the child's own knowledge is guiding the process of acquisition. And there are well-known models from the graph theory world that can be used to guide hypotheses here. Uh, in particular, you might ask, is this a kind of small world uh, network that has a rich get richer kind of power law dynamic in which the words that are learned are those that are best connected, are uh, those that connect to the best connected nodes in the network? That would be a kind of a preferential attachment model where this highly connected node is going to uh, get richer by uh, having the child learn things that are connected to that. If you know, uh, knee and uh, hand and face, maybe the next word you learn is shoulder, right? Or uh, do you have a preferential acquisition model um, where actually the word that's going to get learned is of the words that you don't know already, the best connected word there, where you're actually getting different distinct islands popping up in the graph and only later being connected. So uh, in preferential attachment, it's the dynamics of the network as it is that allow for growth. In preferential acquisition, it's actually the dynamics of the overall adult network, the input network, that drive learning. Uh, and so we can uh, add these sorts of network predictors, uh, again in a regression format, but here where we're using a mixed effects regression and one that takes into account the gradual growth of the network over time. Uh, and what we find is that across, uh, across languages, the adult network, the input network, is actually the most predictive in both phonology and in semantics. So words that are highly connected semantically uh, in our own lexicons and, uh, as adults or highly connected phonologically in the lexicon of English, those are the words that kids learn early. Those are the words that are prevalent in kids' input. Um, they're probably available to uh, kind of low-level statistical learning mechanisms in interesting ways. But the lexicon is not a small world network. It doesn't grow via this uh, preferential attachment, uh, rich get richer kind of process that had been posited. So I think that's kind of a fun uh, finding. OK, so more generally, what I've pitched here is a framework for evaluating learning models. Uh, and I hope you'll take this as an invitation to start to think about ways that more modern AI can be put in in place of the kinds of basic predictive models, um, mostly supervised, that I've described up till now. What I've tried to do here, though, in this talk is develop the kinds of tools that would allow for learning models easily to be evaluated on these sorts of data. In other words, consistent APIs for both input and for outcomes uh, so that these things can be linked quantitatively in search of more quantitative theories of language acquisition. In other words, I hope this serves uh, as much as an invitation as a, de as a demonstration. <laughs>
Okay, to wrap up, uh, what I've argued here is that early language appears to be grounded in communication. Kids learn words for things to communicate about, social routines, people, uh, the objects in their environment. Further, children are consistently variable in their early language. Around the world, they appear to take different routes into language, and that variability is an important desideratum for our learning models. Although eventual attainment should reach a particular plateau, we should also see variance in the trajectory. We saw that grammar emerges as a generalization from vocabulary. At least these two processes are tightly linked. They probably co-inform one another uh, as grammatical generalizations lead to the learning of more words and vice versa. And finally, I hope that you see from this uh, demonstration that larger data sets both reveal the need for and lay the foundations for a quantitative theory of language learning. Thank you very much. Happy to take a few questions now. Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, so I'm in a kind of an interesting position here because I study a system on which it's not necessarily ethical to intervene for the gold standard for causality, right? Um, I can occasionally do some small and probably positive things to kids, but that's about all I have in terms of, you know, I, I, and I'm certainly not allowed to do the kinds of graph surgeries that uh, Pearl recommends for uh, showing causality. So I. Uh, we can't make strong causal inferences of the type that policymakers and social scientists hope for in intervention trials, at least not easily. Um, what I'm trying to do here instead is show you some correlations which I suggest to be theoretically central and probably are likely to be good kind of, I think of them as checkpoints in a software development style uh, for model development. So in, in other words, uh, in terms of theory development, what I'm hoping is that we develop theories that reproduce a number of these phenomena. Now, it could turn out to be the case that this uh, pattern is purely epiphenomenal and isn't reproduced by uh, a model that otherwise gets kind of all of the other important checkpoints along the way. That, so that, that would be a possibility. But I think there are pretty good reasons from the model development perspective to suggest that you would uh, that a large class of models would show this kind of dependence between the uh, diversity of the input data and the strength of the generalizations. So uh, there's no claim of causality. Rather, there's a claim that this is a descriptive regularity that might be important and useful in theory building. But thank you for the question. Yeah, I, I think so. Uh, so the question is about um, the kind of micro processes that lead to the learning of an individual word. Uh, so there's this very large literature that that examines this, and often what is on offer is a proof of concept that a particular route can lead to the learning of of individual words, rather than a demonstration that for the majority of the lexicon they are learned that way. Um, my suspicion is that uh, early words are often heard many, many times and kind of learned via gradual statistical processes as much as by kind of quick supervised insights. But then later on, we get much more supervision, uh, much more kind of explicit teaching of individual lexical items. Look, there's a zebra, uh, these kinds of things. So um, the, trade, the general trade-off that I think people talk about in this literature is between kind of uh, larger amounts of data for an individual word but less certainty, and uh, supervision in the form of social signals or cues, uh, like definition, oh look, uh, that's a, uh, um, uh, that's a uh, chihuahua, it's a kind of dog, you know, where I give you the category and an example at once in a kind of beautiful labeled package that also directs your attention towards the, the kind of key exemplar, right? So, so um, on that continuum, there's, it's an open question how, uh, you know, how much of the lexicon is learned via that supervision uh, versus via kind of um, more unsupervised methods. And it's also an open question uh, whether the kind of degree of supervision that we see in kind of high income uh, households in the US is really representative of how kids learn in other cultures. The suggestion is that actually, you know, in a number of other cultures that have been documented, um, you get 
you know, less than a couple of minutes per hour of child-directed speech of that kind of heavily supervised type uh, as a kid. And so you really wouldn't have enough supervised input to do all that much learning if that's your only route. So, but this is the kind of way that the debate is playing out. Yeah, so, so um, w one study that I was involved in that, that uh, provided some interesting data on this was the Human Speech Home Project, where a guy named Deb Roy instrumented his home and took videos, uh, overhead videos in all of the rooms of his home, uh, made recordings, did laborious human transcription of all of that. And then we tried to do the same kind of predictive regression analysis between factors uh, in that child's individual environment and uh, the child's production of the words. And you find the same general factors, like uh, kind of word frequency as a strong predictor. Um, we also found um, the contextual uh, distinctiveness of the words as a really strong predictor, like um, being used in a particular social routine, like diaper changing or book reading, something like this, um, in a particular spot in the home. Those were really important predictors of whether the child learned a word. So to me, that points to a kind of induction process within a particular social context. But uh, it'd be great if we had you know, 5, 10, 20 more Debroys that were giving us data sets of that size. Yeah, so, so you're raising a bunch of very interesting points. Um, the kind of one core question is about the relationship between uh, language learning and general intelligence, uh, and with a specific question about uh, analogical mapping and, and analogical mechanisms. So there's a kind of, I don't want to go too much into history here. I'm kind of a history of psychology type person. But um, the tradition of measuring people, psychometrics, uh, grew out of an interest in measuring intelligence and general reasoning capacities. And we have a construct called little g, which is the uh, first factor, the first principal component, essentially, in many, many different tasks that measure reasoning. Um, that component is psychometrically extremely stable across the lifespan, across individuals, and it's very highly correlated with many other things. In childhood, it's very highly correlated with language. So it is the case that kids who are on the high end of that vocabulary are also likely those kids who will score well both concurrently and predictively on intelligence tests. The interpretation of that pattern of data is very tricky in my mind. Uh, first, because the psychometric stability of little g, of intelligence, does not imply that there is a thing that it means to be intelligent. And second, um, in a longer list which I won't enumerate, because the fact that uh, intelligence is correlated with language may be a function of the fact that language is extremely stable. I didn't show you this, but it's true that those kids that are on the high end of this variability graph that I'm showing you um, again and again will largely stay on the high end, right? So uh, the kids who are up here, those kids are probably going to stay up there uh, through early childhood. There will be some variability, but, but uh, this is quite a stable measure. So um, there's kind of lifespan stability and very good measurement properties. And for that reason, this may correlate with everything else that you can measure about kids because it's good to measure. In fact, right, if you bring a kid in and they can, they're not shy and are talking to you and doing kind of a good language task in the lab, maybe they're going to do a good, uh, you know, good job on your reasoning task. So there are many different sources of intercorrelation between G uh, and language, some of which may relate to uh, interesting shared learning and reasoning patterns between these different things. And I, I think it's a really an open and interesting question, the extent to which uh, general factors like speed of processing, memory, and attention, and specific factors like analogical reasoning, statistical uh, co-occurrence tracking, and so forth, 
are uh, related to that correlation between language and intelligence. So it's, it's a kind of an exciting and open question, but, but one that's also fraught with many of the correlation co uh, causation issues that I uh, um, uh, was responding to in the earlier question. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, it's not actually a huge difference um, in terms of outcomes. Um, so there is a uh, firstborn advantage, uh, but uh, um, it's quite variable across cultures, surprisingly. Um, so it, it, it's, a, um, it's smaller than the female advantage by a little bit on average. Uh, um, so uh, the hypothesis, right, is that um, kids are, you know, to the extent that there's kind of explicit teaching that's driving uh, differences, that that would be the, um, that, that would predict a large effect size in terms of, of a firstborn advantage. Um, that's not borne out in the data. On the other hand, uh, you have to ask whether there are kind of other peer effects um, uh, worked in there, uh, as well as other socioeconomic effects. Um, if you're a fourth-born kid, you, on average, have a different socioeconomic status than a first-born kid. So, so the, it, it's, uh, it's a little trickier than, um, than I would want, but it's true that the data go in the direction of uh, more unsupervised mechanisms there. So that's a great point. Yes, I do. Uh, let me, um, uh, so the, 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 this talk um, mirrors a book that is um, in progress and almost done, um, which is, uh, is actually currently available on the web. I hope you don't look at it because, you know, it's just a draft. But uh, um, if I look at individual children here, um, so um, here, are, here are trajectories from kids that have kind of 10 data points or more. Um, let me zoom in a little bit. Uh, Um, and so now here I've replotted that as uh, percentiles. So you can see the kind of relative psychometric stability of the, so there's both error and developmental change that are averaged into changes in that line. Uh, but you can see that the ordering in terms of color of those lines really doesn't change all that much across development. So this is a sample of Norwegian kids that had I think uh, 10 measurements or more. Um, and uh, it's really pretty decent. Um, uh, this is the kind of correlation between your score at T1 and T2, plotted by the difference between T1 and T2 for Norwegian and English kids. And you can see that uh, you know, that correlation does go down. Um, but you're talk if you're looking at 20 months, that's the correlation between your eight month score and your 28 month score. So that's like um, you know, three or four X your entire lifespan in terms of the, the delta. Uh, that's a lot of uh, numbers that you, um, but the, I think the basic generalization here is this appears to be quite stable especially from the perspective of a developmental psychologist, I don't expect anything to be stable about kids just because I can't measure it that well. So the fact that like six months out, I can see a correlation of like 0 0.7, 0 0.8, that's like making me very happy. Because that's both, that's both error and developmental change. Yeah, let me see if I can get, I'm not sure if I have this slide, but I might. Um, no, I don't think I have the slide. Um, but yes, yes, that's a really important question um, and one that is kind of prerequisite to the use of these data. So uh, one study, just to, to name one, um, is a study of 200 kids uh, across a two-year period. So they measure language at age 24 months, two years, and then at four years. Uh, and what they do is they do both uh, the CDI type measure uh, but then also a, um, a transcript in the lab and then also an actual kind of pointing and elicitation session. And what you find is, I think, really interesting. Uh, there is a single language construct that uh, is correlated very highly across all these measures and accounts for nearly all of the variance. Um, so it's, it's got a stability of about 0.8. Um, and longitudinally, it has a very strong stability as well. So, um, what I take from that is, is early language is kind of a single construct and you can measure it in a lot of different ways, um, but the, the measurements are surprisingly robust. Um, CDI is one of the most highly correlated with that central factor um, in the factor analysis. Now you might ask, uh, 
Um, our other findings that I showed you uh, related to parent bias. And that's, that's a hard question to answer in the general case. In the specific case, I can tell you that that particular study that I was just citing uh, finds exactly the same effect size for English in terms of the gender differential uh, using the lab measures as we do for the parent report measures. So that comforted me because I was worried that what we measured was a consistency across cultures in the degree of parent bias towards girls' language. Uh, and I don't think that that's the case from that study, uh, as well as a couple of other in-lab studies. Yes, so, uh, so the question is, um, are there studies relating verbal uh, to spatial and mathematical abilities? So very little in young children because the, our ability to measure stably the kind of spatial thinking abilities in less than two and a half year old is very, very limited. We could measure, for example, mental rotation of a single object or something like this. Uh, that said, as you go a little Older in childhood, there is a huge psychometric literature looking at school achievement, uh, te standardized test scores, and other measures. Uh, so when you do a factor analysis of standardized test scores, you see that single correlation, that single factor. The first principal component is extremely strong. That's G. So there's a strong relationship between language and math and basically everything else that you measure uh, that involves kind of reasoning and intellectual ability. Then, if you look at the uh, next couple factors, you will see a differentiation between language and math. Um, and there's a large literature on uh, gender differences or lack thereof and so forth um, in those factors. Uh, so there, are, uh, there is psychometric stability of verbal ability as distinct from spatial ability, but uh, in the population as a whole, you get a very, very high correlation between these two things just by virtue of that uh, single principal component. Thank you.